Hi everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Hirschsprung's disease. So let's get into it. So this is also known as congenital aganglionic megacolon. So breaking that down a little bit, congenital meaning you're born with it, A meaning the absence of, and then ganglionic, so the ganglion cells of the colon. So the nerve cells in the bowel, they don't form at all or they don't form completely. And this is a big deal because our nerve cells are what's causing the peristalsis. So the contractions of the bowels that helps move food and waste through our bowels. So for somebody who has this, that's not happening, okay? So it's not being moved through. This specifically affects the sigmoid portion of the colon. And some risk factors, there's not a ton of them, but it's usually associated with a genetic component. So if you have a family history of it, being of male gender, and then trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome. So these are the populations of people who are more likely to get this illness. Now let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms. A memory tool to help you remember is sarcasm. So S stands for sigmoid colon because it affects the sigmoid colon. A is for the absence of movement, so the absence of paracelsis of the bowel. R is for ribbon-shaped stool. This usually occurs in the older child. So typically, this is something we notice right away in newborns, but if we catch it in the older child, the biggest symptom they have is chronic constipation. And when they do have a bowel movement, they have ribbon-shaped stool. C is for congenital, right, because you're born with it, and of course, constipation, that's the big one. A is for abdominal obstruction or abdominal distension because the stool is not moving through the bowel like it's supposed to. And abnormal feeding, so poor feeding. They're not eating well. The newborn can't eat very well. They're not interested in eating. S is for syndrome, Down syndrome. So trisomy 21 we said was a risk factor. So a symptom of aganglionic megacolon is they don't. They don't have that bowel movement within the first 24 hours. And one other thing I wanted to point out, it didn't fit nicely in my little um, mnemonic device here, but since this is a pediatric issue, I wanted to add failure to thrive because this is another thing we will see in newborns and even in older children. So this is something I wanted to add as well. So how is this diagnosed? First, they're going to do an assessment, right? A really proper head-to-toe assessment of the newborn. They're going to notice that they're not having that first meconium, and then they might have some abdominal dissension, maybe some poor feeding. And then the number one thing that they're going to do after that is a rectal biopsy. This is kind of the gold standard diagnostic procedure that's going to let us know what's going on. They may also choose to do an abdominal x-ray so they can get a visualization of what's happening. And in the older child, so not the newborn, they might do uh, measurements. So measuring the muscles around the rectum. That might be something they do in the older child. And then what do we as the nurse do about it? What can we do about it? Well, as you can imagine, this is very serious. So they require surgery. So there's two types of surgeries they might have. The first is called the pull-through surgery, which is laparoscopic. This is where they insert through the anus and it's minimally invasive. So obviously this is the more ideal choice if we can do that one. The other option is the ostomy surgery. So this is actually going to be two separate procedures. The first thing they're going to do is create an ostomy. This is going to allow time to heal. So the portion of the bowel that's affected, that is damaged, they're allowing it time to heal. Then after they have said that it's sufficient, um, they're gonna do the second procedure where they close the ostomy and then connect the intestine, the healthy part of the intestine, to either the anus or the rectum, whichever is healthy, whichever has healthier tissue. So your nursing interventions are going to be related to these things. 
So preoperative care, all of the things we have to do preoperative. We want to make sure, especially since they're little, that we are paying very close attention to their fluid and electrolyte balance. So IV fluids is key, strict INO is key. They're also going to have an NG tube, so we'll have to insert that. Very rarely, but sometimes they might require the use of laxatives before surgery. Of course, they're going to be NPO. After surgery, we're going to manage pain. If they do have the ostomy surgery, then we need to teach them about colostomy care and caring for it, or teach mom and dad. And then, of course, the big one, assessing bowel sounds after surgery, assessing bowel movements after surgery, things like that. After successful surgery, they should be able to have a bowel movement. A few other things I wanted to add are just some things to watch for after they've had surgery. So children after surgery might experience both diarrhea and constipation, so look out for that. They also might have bowel incontinence, so leaking of stool. If they are toddler age, if they're at potty training age, they might have delays. So they might not be potty trained at the age that is common. Um, so there are delays in potty training sometimes. And then the big one, they are at risk for having a bowel infection, especially within that first year after the surgery. So you want to be watching out for signs of infection. So that was my video. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.